Welcome to the discussion. My guest today, Colonel Kerry George, the Deputy Director of Maintenance Policy and Programs at the Army. Colonel Marlon Crook, the Deputy Director for the National Guard Bureau for CIO J6 Directorate. Mark Fox, the Senior Manager for Global Defense Programs at Amazon Web Services. And Risa Savold, the Technical Director at Infor for Federal and DOD Solutions. Welcome to the program. Let me start with some context for our discussion. Let me start with some good news. Defense Department officials told Congress earlier this year that timely, adequate, predictable, and sustained funding over the last two years has significantly increased the number of brigade combat teams' readiness at the highest levels. Every military service and agency is better prepared to address threats around the world and in the United States from a people and equipment perspective. Okay, now the bad news. There's still a long way to go to ensure continued to complete success in getting people, equipment, weapons, food, and all the things that makes the military run well in place. In fact, the National Defense Strategy recognized this challenge. One of the key focus areas is to restore joint readiness. The challenge is, according to many experts, there's a shortfall of current methods for assessing readiness. This is true especially when it comes to equipment and parts as systems are disparate and old, data sharing is arduous and filled with dirty data, and the skills of the workforce haven't necessarily kept up with the industry best practices. On, on top of that, there's ever-growing concerns about supply chains, both from a manufacturing perspective and from a cybersecurity risk standpoint. So how can DOD consume information in real time to make better decisions? How can the military improve the current hub and spoke model that current logistics officers are currently bound by? And finally, what is the technology that can lead to increasing readiness in that joint manner that the National Defense Strategy is calling for? Well, that's where our guests come in. Colonel George, let's start with you. Readiness is, is one of those topics we hear a lot about, and there's multiple kinds of readiness. There's the people, there's the equipment, there's the, the broader perspective. Let's just talk about your current state of readiness, how you view it, how are you measuring success, how do you ensure the asset, assets are in the right place at the right time for the right reasons? So, well, as a logistician, uh, several, uh, several uh, aspects of readiness I'm very concerned about. You know, do we have the transportation assets in place? Do we have the prepositioned stocks? Uh, do we have the ability to move things around the battlefield? Do we have the ability to track, uh, track, predict, and, and affect maintenance uh, to keep our fighting forces uh, moving forward in the battle? Um, in general, we're on track. The, uh, the Army uh, stated we, we, have some, we have some stated readiness goals to achieve by 2020, and uh, as, you, as you mentioned with the additional the steady funding we've been receiving, we're on track to achieve those goals for 2020. Uh, some of the things that we are, some of the ways we measure that, is we're measuring it through our exercises. We have uh, rotational forces going through Europe, so we're assessing how well can we flow those forces in, how effective are they in the exercises, and then the logistics tail. Uh, are we able to deliver the equipment they need on time? And when they're done, are we able to bring that equipment back on time, reset, re, uh, refit it, and have it ready for the next deployment? And well, there are definitely some things we're learning through that process. Uh, getting in and out of Europe, especially under peacetime conditions, there are constraints that we don't anticipate that we would have in a, in a, in a true wartime scenario. But it's making us better. It's making us better at predicting our requirements. Uh, it, it's making a... It, but it's also making us challenge the way challenge ourselves and the way we assess uh, the way we assess our readiness, which is a good thing. Um, we're looking to how do we go to a more predictive model of maintenance rather than uh, the legacy model where you, you bring your vehicle in every three months for an oil change, whether whether it needs it or not, every three months for a thousand miles. So now we're looking to a more a, a predictive model where the vehicle tells you the same thing our, our cars do do for us now. Um, it decreases the time, it decreases the resources required, it saves us funds. When, when you talk about the predictive model, I think that's a, it's a really interesting change that, that you're getting to because I think as you, you brought up this idea of, well, it's 3,000 miles, let's bring it in and, and do all this work. That, that's, that's a huge change, and, and that's, we'll get to this later, but that's playing into the, the bigger discussion. Yes. And, and maybe talk just, a little, just briefly about how you can move from that where you are today to that, you, you said goals in 2020. I imagine the predictive side of it is, is at least the beginnings there. One is starting to take, take advantage of today's technology today. Uh, so most of our vehicles, are, they, they have built-in sensors that are, that are tracking the oil life monitor, they're tracking how the vehicle's performing. So our new vehicles, as it, our view, new vehicles and new combat systems, they're being fitted with those sensors. Uh, the next step, the Army, uh, in conjunction with Army Material Command, is uh, working towards developing that condition-based maintenance model, uh, cloud-based computing, taking all this analytical data and starting to predict when those maintenance failures are going to happen. And it's not, not just from a maintenance standpoint, it's so that we can predict when that vehicle is going to meet, need to be down so that we can plan around that for combat operations, for training, you know, control when we're going to fix that vehicle under, under our conditions versus the force conditions. It's better to fix it in the motor pool than it is to fix it on the side of the road somewhere 
when you're potentially under enemy fire. All right, Colonel Crook, let's uh, turn to you. He mentioned the, 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 that, that word cloud. Well, I'm sure we'll get more into it in a little bit, but talk sure. about from a readiness standpoint, how are you guys helping out from the uh, National Guard Bureau? As the National Guard, we have one standard for readiness and we pride in ourselves since the inception of the National Guard and uh, always being ready and always being there. Um, we're a community-based organization, uh, governor supportive. Uh, it's the there part that's uh, ever expanding. You have the traditional domains, land, sea, air, um, but we also have now with space and cyber, that's uh, an, an expansive role that the Guard still has to uh, continue to innovate and be agile and be flexible and continue to expand their roles to always be ready, always be there. Uh, we measure those through also with exercises and staying lockstep and in interoperable with our, uh, our counterparts. But we also have to do the same with our uh, private industry and our state and federal uh, partners and our local uh, responders. And we use de decision support systems like uh, sorts and DERS, which I think we'll talk about a little later. It's interesting that, that obviously when it comes to the National Guard, it's a hurricane can strike, a wildfire can strike, and you guys can be called into action immediately. So from a readiness standpoint, it, you can't have everything. You, it's a lot of just in time. I'm, I'm sure is, is that the is that sure. kind of the but, theme in but, some but, ways? But the uniqueness of the Guard, again, we're a community-based organization. So we're spread across the 54 states and territories. To be exact, we're in 2,600 communities. So as far as a military organization, we are the most uh, widely present. Our presence is the, of any military organization across uh, the continental U.S. So it's, it's, it's the constant state of readiness, as you said, that that's the big, if you will, difference with the Army versus uh, maybe where other military services is. So from a readiness standpoint, just to kind of put a, a finer point on it, because it's the constant state, does that change how you measure, how you, how you look at readiness in the, in the broad terms? Yes, uh, I, I would say so. Um, and that's what we're, we're constantly trying to, um, I guess, refine that because okay. you can't be everywhere <laughs> at all times. Right. But we have to be that surge, surge force, whether we're called upon in uh, our federal or non-federalized mission, uh, just like you said, for instance, for the elections. Yeah. Uh, that's hot. That, that's a hot uh, topic in the um, Although not a military problem, uh, Chief of our National Guard Bureau, General Ellen Gale, just spoke last week on the state of readiness and how the National Guard is able to respond for election support. Although it's not a military problem, the, each governor has some form of um, cyber support that they can lend to their state because it's a very state-centric problem um, to detect anomalies, if you will, uh, if nothing else, to, to see if there's something that we can call on, follow on services to assist. The cyber readiness piece is a whole different discussion. We'll, maybe we'll get there a little bit later. Sure. Let me uh, bring in uh, Mark Fox from Amazon Web Services. When you talk with your clients or your customers, whether it's DOD or non-DOD, wh what is the conversation like around readiness right now? So I think the Colonel's comments are consistent, right? It's, Which Colonel, by the way, we have two. Uh, yeah. Colonel here. Uh, <laughs> Colonel George. George, yes. So uh, the, the comments are consistent and, and you hear them across all the military departments. Uh, which is there's been an acknowledgement over the past number of years, uh, particularly on the weapon system side, uh, and some very well-known instances, uh, that we were not meeting the goals. We had too many aircraft, too many other systems that were down, uh, and then also challenges on the personal readiness. So we hear that as consistent. Um, we get the questions around how can industry, you know, how can folks in, in the space that we play in the cloud computing side, how can they play a role? And I think it comes back to what was mentioned in both the comments is it starts out as a data problem. You know, you've got these systems now, like you talked about, the telematics and the IoT capabilities. Almost all of these platforms um, are massive sensors and multiple sensors that are on them uh, that are creating a massive amount of data, oftentimes out at the edge in faraway places with you know, minimal connectivity in a DDL environment. Um, so you, you know, you've got to start with that data that in some cases is very far away. How is that data pulled together? Uh, and shared broadly, if that data is kept you know, just within, let's say, a BCT environment, they've got maybe some visibility into their environment, but you don't have visibility across the Army. So maybe uh, you know, one team is at a very high state of readiness, another is not. You know, how can you try to balance those things out? So I think, it, you know, Jason, it really comes back to, it starts with a data problem, a data collection problem, and then downstream how to deal with that data to, to get what is my current state of readiness, to start to make some decisions out of that.
It always comes back to the data, doesn't yeah, it? It does. It's just what it feels like. And, and Risa, from Infor's perspective, as you, again, work with uh, government clients, the same question I'll give you, Mark. What, what are some of the trends? What are some of the things you're hearing? So absolutely, we also hear all about the data from our commercial customers as well as our government customers. When it comes to topics like material availability or equipment readiness, there's a common thought that simply having all that data at your fingertips is going to help us move the needle and achieve our readiness goals. And many people think that just means um, being able to aggregate that data from multiple sources and serve it up. But today, technology makes that problem relatively easy, but it's masking a much more difficult and fundamental problem. Um, data is our biggest problem and also our biggest opportunity. And historically, the problem has been, can we trust that data? Um, if we can't trust that data, we can't trust those insights, and we're not going to meet those readiness goals. So yeah. as a software provider, we invest a lot in data management and our data solutions and making those a key part of our requirements. And I'm really glad that we're talking both about our operational tempo and personnel tempo because we apply some of these same principles and technologies across all the domains. You bring up a really interesting point because one of the things that, that I've seen when I was doing some research is this dirty data idea and this concern of well, if your data is not great or if it's not supporting or if you can't get access to it, when you talk about the, the challenges, is that the one that just stands out in front of you time and again as you talk to clients? It's like, well, where's your data? Well, it's over there. Well, can you get to it? Well, maybe not today. Talk maybe through that, that challenge of the dirty data and the, and the, the, inter, the lack of interoperability. Certainly. Um, part of it is that we, there are so many different systems throughout the Department of Defense. And in joint operations, all the systems do have to work together and we have to share that data. Um, in my career, I've done a lot of systems modernizations and evaluations, and one of the first things is to actually um, take a close look at all the data. Are they even describing the same thing? Are they we using the same terminology or the same codes? And um, in data science, some 60% of the effort is actually spent cleaning up that data before we can do any analytics, develop any reports or dashboards, or even start looking at technologies like artificial intelligence. That is a great number, 60, that's probably, I would say it's probably higher, but mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. Uh, Colonel George, let's bring you back into the conversation. The data discussion comes in, uh, you got to have the right data. Uh, what is the Arm, Army I know is working on a new data strategy, that's the bigger, broader, you know, the CIO G, G6 folks, but talk maybe a little bit about, from your perspective, the role that data is playing in, in the readiness. Yeah, absolutely, uh, data is, is going to drive, drive the change here. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have in the Army is that we have a lot of data and it's all on very discrete one-off systems. So not only being able to understand, make sure we're talking the same data, but can we, can we actually access all those systems? We're moving forward in some ways. Uh, IPSA, the Integrated Paying Personnel System, is one of the ways where we're, we're pulling in 40, des uh, 40 desperate uh, uh, paying personnel systems into a single dashboard. Uh, as we move forward to this condition-based maintenance, uh, we'll be looking at the same thing. The data coming off of each of the platforms isn't necessarily going to be the same. And then how are we going to be able to compute at the edge to give that operator what they need on, the, on that vehicle to, to react now, the battalion the ability to react in the next 24, 48 hours, and then big army to be able to aggregate that and see what's happening total fleet and across the analysis. Colonel Crook, jump in as well, data from your perspective, are you also, is, is data any better because of, of the ubiquity of the National Guard across the country, or is it, is, does Iowa have a different kind of data store than, than, than you know, uh, Tennessee? <laughs> well, that, that's true. That's uh, right. Across the 54 states and territories, we say there are 54 different uh, uh, National Guards, individual National Guards. But however, uh, Chief of the National Guard Bureau's top, one of his top priorities is uh, data and getting after the data so he can look at it across the 54 for the Air National Guard and the Army National Guard. So. Um, we are trying to standardize um, harnessing that data and making it actionable data. So we're investing in uh, uh, chief, data and chief, chief data and officer, chief technical officer, data scientists, so we can manage that data into a joint dashboard so that the uh, chief can have log stats, purse stats, readiness at his fingertips on a dashboard and as far as interoperability so we can get feeds not only from the services but our, our partners. Uh, at, at his fingertips. Currently, w what's it look like today? Is it a bunch of different dashboards? Is it a bunch of different Excel spreadsheets? 
a you, combination yeah. of everything you just said. Yes. And, 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 and the and same a, thing for the Army. A, a very manual process with some legacy systems. And I can only imagine a data call also is a very manual process. Sure. In a lot of cases, especially on the logistics side, we've, uh, we've, we've had various systems, but a lot of times it still comes down to that supply sergeant or that uh, supply officer down there manually inputting something in a spreadsheet that's getting aggregated and, and input into a system somewhere else. So um, if we can get to the point where we're pulling that information directly off of a system, take the human out of the loop on that and remove the human error as well as the processing time, we'll certainly be in a much better position to use that data to our advantage and turn it into information or powerful knowledge. So, yeah. Risa, are you cringing a little bit when you hear that it's all manually Excel spreadsheets? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> But, but not, not in a bad way, right? I mean, just like knowing that there's a, there's a better way to do this. I think that's, that's what, what we're here for. But, but are you seeing that, that people understand that there is a better way or people hug their spreadsheets still? Yes. I yes think, to both. <laughs> yes to both. <laughs> yeah. um, definitely modernizing some of our information systems will help a little bit with the data problem, um, putting validation um, into the system as people are entering data. But I think there's always going to be a place for human operators as part of that decision cycle. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we can talk more about that modernizing those data systems and all those disparate databases. You're listening to the panel discussion, Maximizing Efficiencies, Readiness, and Asset Management at DOD, sponsored by Infor on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network.